to um, some folks on our campus in Geneva at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. So I kind of gave this uh, talk in light of the, the potential new monster that was occurring in the region um, in light of the, the, the lore of the Seneca Lake mon monster. And then I realized that the FLCC has its own, um, I don't know, I guess it's Flick um, mascot. And so I thought that was really cool just to include on the um, Canandaigua, considering this is the Canandaigua Lake Watershed Association um, uh, talk today. So, and I'm so happy to give this talk because I was supposed to give it last year um, and it was canceled. So I'm so happy that I could still give the talk um, in our new and improved format of Zooming all everywhere we go. So, um, so I'd like to uh, first acknowledge, can you see my second slide, uh, Sonia? Just wanna make sure. Yep, looks good. Great. Um, I just wanna acknowledge all of the students that I have worked with over the last uh, about six years, five years, I guess, um, that have helped me with pr this project because um, working at a small liberal arts college, there is no way to get work done unless you have a band of students um, to work with. And uh, a, the person that's first listed here, Nolan Michaels, who is pictured in um, three of these pictures, the one on the lower left with me, um, is the person who uh, kind of got me into this project of learning about the round goby because of his experience fishing in and around Oneida Lake and um, even towards um, uh, Oneida River out towards Lake Ontario. And he was really curious about round goby. Um, so, and after that, I kind of got into these really cool research project um, experiments that involved all of these other students and of course, um, my colleagues in the biology department, Megan Brown, um, as well as all of the Finger Lakes PRISM staff, uh, including Patty Wakefield, um, Sam Beck Anderson, Hillary Mosier. Some of you may know these people from um, invasive species workshops that the FLI gives. And Brent Boscarino, who is a colleague of Megan Brown, who now works at the Hudson, um, the lower Hudson pr uh, PRISM of the state. So. Anyways, so um, all of this would not be um, would not be possible without them. So I wanted to kind of um, come back to this sea monster um, idea, right? So sea monsters, hmm, if we're thinking about identifying around Gobi, a new invader, right? You want to think about how would we identify them? And so if you were to identify a sea monster, what features would it have? Well, of course, it would have this large head horse or camel-like head that would uh, protrude up above the water, long neck, sometimes up to 12 feet, with lots of bumps that kind of emerge out of the water like a serpentine or an animal. And it can swim uh, for long distances, very long, right? Well, I bring all of this up because there is truly, and many, many of you I'm sure already know this, but there is actually a Facebook page for the Seneca Lake monster. Um, the lore still exists out on Seneca Lake. Um, and when the early steamboats were driving around the Finger Lakes, um, Canandaigua, Seneca, other lakes, Cayuga, this is where folks would see these potential monsters and get really worried about them. But of course, we take these things as humans into a different context. And there's lots of history of, you know, making all sorts of funny jokes about um, the Seneca Lake sea monster. And there are some large fish out there. Uh, and, and obviously, something like this, I think this is actually um, some sort of catfish. And um, although we don't see catfish, they're probably this big. We do have some pretty cool um, sea monsters, if you will, of Seneca Lake. And those are the, uh, are the Finger Lakes. And the, that is the, the sturgeon, the lake sturgeon. This is my colleague, Don Dittman from the USGS, um, who does study sturgeon. And I, I will not be presenting anything on sturgeon today, but um, I have done some trials, feeding trials with juvenile sturgeon because this is something that we are also really interested about whether or not the round goby interacts with juvenile sturgeon. Um, so moving on to the topic of the night, round goby. 
how do we identify them? So they are, are similar to some of the species that we see in the, um, in the, the Finger Lakes and the Great Lakes, and they are different also in other ways. Um, one of the things that uh, is many times identified on fact sheets are the blacks, is the black spot up on the dorsal fin up at the top here and um, they have these double dorsals, if you will, but this black spot doesn't always show up. And uh, I'm not really sure why, but I've seen this uh, in fish that I've actually captured from Cave Lake. Uh, they do have a really nice long anal fin here, as well as um, the, the pelvic fin um, is very different. It's actually fused. And if you were to look at this from below, it actually looks like a suction cup. And one of the things that I was, uh, and some of the other researchers that started looking at round goby, they were a little concerned about because there are um, a number of marine go uh, gobies and also, also freshwater gobies in Hawaii that can actually scale uh, large cliffs because they basically use their suction cup to work their way up vertical surfaces. And so we were a little worried about this considering some of the, obviously the waterfalls in the region, but also just movement and dispersal around the, um, around the region. So these round gobies are invasive and um, they are very similar to our native sculpins. And so this is one of the big questions. Um, and in fact, this is probably the biggest confusion of any fish with a round goby, and that is either the mottled or the slimy sculpin. <clears throat> These sculpin also um, reside in a similar place on the bottom of the lake. They have very similar fin structure. They don't have the, the dark spot on the top, the first dorsal, but they do have these sets of um, large pectoral fins, which is mirrored in the round goby, uh, but also this, the pelvic fin the pelvic fins are actually separate. The other thing that's really interesting that it would be very um, differentiating would be the fact that native sculpins do not have scales on their body. And there are some species of fish that don't have scales. We think of that as a requirement for fish, but those in the catfish family, bullhead and catfish don't have scales, um, but most other fish do, but the sculpin doesn't and the goby does. So this is something that you can always kind of double check as well, in addition to the fused pelvic fin. Now they could also be confused with some other fish that we might catch either on the, um, on, on the end of your line or if you were out looking for these um, with particular type of equipment, um, as I mentioned, the modeled sculpin, there is actually a another invasive that is called the tube nose goby. We don't have any of them quite around here. However, they are in, um, in I believe they, they are in Lake Erie um, at one end and um, they are in the St. Lawrence, but they we haven't seen them around here too much. And I just, um, I, I just learned a little bit more about this after being on a master's thesis committee um, out of Syracuse. And um, they don't seem to be invading as well as the round goby uh, in comparison, but they are also uh, from the same place. But some of the other natives that we have are the darters. And so darters are small fish species that are in the perch family. As you can see, the log perch here, this one gets pretty large compared to the others, but tessellated darter, johnny darter, they all have this similar behavior of propping themselves up on the bottom of the, of the water, whether it's river, stream, or lake, uh, and they have similar fin structures. All right, so how did this goby even get here? Well, um, like many invasive species to the Finger Lakes um, and to the, the, the Great Lakes, they were introduced to North America in 1990 first detected in 1990 through the St. Clair River, which connects Lake Huron to Lake Erie. So that's way down here, right? Um, in what seems like a long, long ways from where we are. Um, and they came to us by ballast water. And uh, what's interesting, you know, with the news of the, the, the ship blocking the Suez Canal a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, every once in a while we remind ourselves that these large ships move around the 
the globe, bringing all sorts of goods to us and also bringing things that we don't necessarily want. So shipping is a huge uh, vector for invasive species. And I found this really neat, um, last year I found this really neat diagram that really helps us to understand how ballast water um, works in cargo ships, right? So on the upper left-hand corner here, it says at the source port, right? They're bringing, they're discharging cargo. So they're, they're taking the, the goods, um, human goods, if you will, off the ship and they're bringing in ballast water from that port. That holds the ship nice and balanced um, to keep it from tipping side to side or forward backward, right? Because the cargo hold is empty. And then when they get to their destination, they start picking up cargo and they release that ballast water into the, the port, the harbor that they are in, and then they take that cargo to wherever it's going, right? So you might think, okay, well, that's interesting. That's, that's a good way, that's a really easy way to get things to move around, right? Um, What's interesting about these fish is that um, the round goby are a benthic fish. They are freshwater. And um, although they have many, many marine species um, that are relatives, I've seen them in the ocean. And um, it just tells you that they've uh, really diversified in a number of different habitats. But this, this fish comes from the Black and Caspian Seas in Eurasia. And they do inhabit, even in their native range, lakes, rivers, and streams. And they sit up, as this picture shows and some of the other pictures I've shared, have um, this kind of propped up um, angled position. And they really do prefer rocky substrate. But what's been interesting to see is, especially in the Finger Lakes in my research, is that they will move into just about any habitat um, when their preferred habitats are crowded. Uh, what's also interesting about this fish is that they are very territorial and they can maintain a territory, a small territory of about five meters in um, circumference. So it's like the, the, an area that they do actually maintain it. I've watched them from above and they move about and they are very protective of that area. What's also to add to this dispersal factor, um, they also move quite a bit. And so some individuals were um, found to move up to 200 kilometers, sorry, two kilometers in 200 days in lakes and up to four kilometers in a year, just based on the invasion front that they present, um, presented in various new places uh, in the Midwest. Okay, so ballast water, the ship taking water in from into the bottom of the, the tank, but generally, they're not that too far away from the, um, they're that too, they're, they're kind of far away from the bottom, right? So how does a benthic fish get into ballast water of a ship, especially when it doesn't have any cargo in it, right? Well, if you, um, hopefully you all can see this animation, uh, many, many benthic organisms and organisms that are in the water column go through diurnal or diurnal vertical migrations. And that means that as the, as the day passes, whether it be sunshine, sunshine or um, cloudy days, right? Uh, the, during the day, a lot of organisms are down where the light is low. And then as night arrives about now, they start to rise up towards the surface of the water. And this is exactly how it's thought that the, um, the gobies in particular are moving into the ballast water, that actually the larval stages or the juvenile stages of the gobies are moving up into the water column to feed and following all those plankton um, at night and that's when they're going into the ballast waters. Now, <clears throat> interestingly, all of the, the invasive species that I have on this, uh, on this slide here, zebra mussels, quagga mussels, tube nose, water flea, um, and bloody red shrimp all arrived in that same way. And some of this um, makes sense, right? If you're a small plankton, um, zooplankton like a water flea, 
you're moving about the water column, avoiding predators as you can. Uh, but zebra mussels and quagga mussels also have larval, larval mobile stages. And so they are moving as um, the essentially those, those new gametes as well as those newly formed organisms are, are moving around the water as a, um, a mobile larval organism. And that's how they get into the, the uh, ballast waters. So there's good news, right? So in 1993, the US Coast Guard began requiring all ocean going ships carrying ballast water to exchange that water in open ocean. So they pull in salt water. And then in 2008, ocean going ships were required to that were carrying cargo, so very little ballast, were required to what we call swish and spit ocean water to eliminate the, the spread of um, these freshwater species from other ports. So that should have changed the, um, the introduction of these um, invasives from at least cargo coming from other freshwater ports. So the not so good news is that um, it didn't take too long for the round goby to spread around the, the Great Lakes. And as you can see into uh, New York waters, inland New York waters, Onondaga Lake, um, Oneida Lake, and Cayuga Lake, as you can see, which is on this map um, by 2012. So let's look specifically at the Finger Lakes region, the, we, what we know right now. Um, the first is that the Gabrown Gobi was detected in 2011 in Cayuga Lake um, and a couple of different occasions, 2011, 2012, and it was detected at the south end of Cayuga in 2013. It was detected across the water um, bottom of the lake uh, by 2014, and then in 2016 it was found in the Seneca Cayuga Canal. Interestingly, that was about when we started doing our research, started to wonder whether or not it would make it up into Seneca. And so we started some of our monitoring around Seneca Lake, as well as um, taking fish from Cayuga Lake, which is where this X mark is. This is the Cayuga Lake State Park. Uh, and that is um, what all of our um, fish that you'll see in, in experimental graphs here, um, where they all came from for, for our studies. We didn't find any in Seneca Lake, however, in 2017, there was a rainbow trout reported to have a round goby in its stomach to the New York DEC, folks in the Region 8 New York DEC. And then in 2018, there was a report directly to me from an angler who said, oh yeah, I've caught them off of Dresden, the, the shoreline of Dresden. This, was a, this is an avid lake trout and probably other fish angler in Seneca. And Although there was no confirmation to anybody uh, in the New York DC or other governmental agencies, I'm sure that it was, that was true. To this date, we still have not had any reference to or any confirmation that, that Seneca has gobies in it, but I am sure that they are there based on some of this movement and evidence. So just to remind us of what invasive means, this means that these are species that whether they're native or not native, they cause ecologic and economic harm because they can just about eat anything, they can reproduce very quickly, and they can get around really easily. They have no problem with other competitors for food or habitat related to uh, the reproductive cycle, or they, and they don't really have any uh, predators, that in, at least initially, that would um, consider them good prey. Now, uh, based on my title, I would think that the most of these characteristics are cons for why we would not want the round goby, or for that matter, any invasive species around. Um, so it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a hard sell to see if they're pros, but we'll see if we get there. Um, so why are we concerned about them? Well, in particular, the round goby has been known to spawn up to six times a year, which means that not only can uh, they produce a lot of young, they also, their population can grow and spread spatially quite rapidly. In addition, they take food, they're voracious predators themselves. They, 
they're territorial, and from a, either from shelter, from a nesting site, or from, from just the perspective of uh, food sources or protecting themselves from predators, they're going to be good competitors with other native forage fish. They are what really well known to eat game fish eggs. And this is one of the concerns that we have for in many of the larger Finger Lakes and obviously to the Great Lakes initially with, uh, with lake trout and other um, salmonid species. Uh, they do eat zebra mussels. This is something that they, they eat in their native range. And although that could be a good thing, that it was, might be something that, well, that's great because we have those two. Maybe we get rid of some of them. I'm not so sure that they can actually control or regulate the, the zebra mussel population. There is some also concern that is um, not yet known as to whether or not toxins uh, can be spread in slightly different ways through the round goby and up the food chain. I work with some of the my colleagues at the Finger Lakes Institute, Lisa Kleckner, as well as my colleague at um, SUNY ESF, Roxanne Razavi. We have done a number of studies on mercury accumulation, and there is concern of how round goby bioaccumulates mercury in the, in the water from their prey, as well as transferring it and magnifying it up the food web. So we're still, we're still not sure about the end result on that, but um, we're in the process of thinking about and working on that. And obviously they can live in a wide range of habitats, including low oxygen, um, silty places. They can live in very extreme temperatures. They can live in very warm water, which doesn't bode well for some of our um, some of our lakes in the summer times. So competitively, they do interact with a number of these other forage fish. And you'll see, you'll hear about these darters in just a moment. Um, I think that that is probably one of the most um, negatively impacted fish. Uh, although there are not as many publications on how this actually happens, I think that the um, from what I've read and heard is that the, the these little darters are going to be pretty much interfered, uh, their, their nesting sites are going to be interfered with um, for, uh, by, by Rome, round goby competition. So whether they're producing, um, creating a nest or they're trying to find food, that territoriality characteristic of the round goby is going to really impact these darters, which also sit on the bottom of the lake. Um, bluegill sunfish, also those make the nest building fish um, could be of a concern with respect to round goby that, uh, that prey upon eggs, especially in concentrated areas. So from the literature, I'm going to show you some tables with lots of numbers and things like that. But this is from some of the, the common literature from the Great Lakes, just to show you kind of what they've, round goby has been found to eat, because this is really the concern we had was, will they actually change the invertebrate prey supply uh, in our lakes and therefore potentially change how native fish are going to be able to survive um, to, to be able to produce the number of healthy eggs that they have to produce every year to maintain their populations and on and on. So some of the things that you'll see in this top table represent um, a number of different types of invertebrates. Hemimysis is something I'll talk about later. It's the bloody red shrimp and it is also an invasive species uh, from the same place that the brown gobies are from. Um, a number of these other things are um, either insects like chironomids, Trichopterans, ephemeropterans, those of you who are anglers who use flies. Um, if you fly fish, you know what these are because these are all insects that um, fish eat on the bottom of the, of the water. A number of these other things are invertebrates that are either um, uh, some type of um, arthropod or we also have uh, a couple of, there's mussels in here and another plankton, ostracods. So they eat different things in different places, but the point is here that this, um, this particular article showed that hemimysis was not part of the diet. And that was interesting because they're from the same place. So that was kind of an interesting head scratching moment for us. Um, and then if you look at the second table down below, you can see that 
this study looked at how the diet changed with the size of the fish. So the small juveniles ate mostly mollusks and crustaceans. And then as they became larger, you see um, these worms and fish becoming part of their diet. And what's also interesting in our studies and our in reading is that we've found that the size of the muscle also is changes that's being consumed changes as the goby changes. So these larger gobies are eating large muscles um, versus small gobies are eating small muscles and snails. Um, another study that I uh, wanted to highlight is a study that looked at streams, and these are streams that are off of tributaries to Lake Erie. And this is by um, Krako, Krakowiak and Penudo. And this particular study was curious about what types of invertebrate prey would change with, um, with the presence of goby. So they looked at different, study, different um, uh, streams that had gobies and some streams that didn't have gobies to see what the differences were. And what the invertebrates showed here was with gobies present, there were a number of um, different rich, uh, diversity and um, biotic indices, essentially ways to tell, to group taxa together to figure out what might be, um, might change. And so EPT, which is ephemeropter, placoptera, play and tricoptera, that's your mayfly, caddisfly, tri uh, and um, um, stoneflies, um, they were um, kind of lower, but not significantly. However, um, the taxa richness was su super low in places where round gobies were compared to where they were absent. Um, and the densities uh, were, were kind of back and forth. Um, it was hard to tell here, but let's look at a graph, right? So significant differences between these streams showed up in taxa richness. So that would be this first set of bars. So gobies were present in the streams that had, um, in, in the, they were, where gobies were present, the, the taxa richness was lower. So the number of species that were found was lo significantly lower than when gobies were absent. Um, similarly for EPT, you can see it a little bit better here, as well as the Shannon diversity index, which accounts for abundance as well as richness and then this EPT to midge ratio, which gives you an idea of the um, health of the stream as well. So we can conclude from this study that essentially round gobies have a significant impact on invertebrate stream communities for sure. Um, and I was really concerned about that because we have a number of tributaries that are very important places for, um, for not only the stream fish that live there, but also the, uh, the spawning trout that move upstream um, and some trout that live in the stream year round. Here's another part of this study, we're looking at the fish. And I think I'm going to skip to this next slide, but essentially you can see that um, there are some similar types of indices that were shown where gobies, where they were present. Um, the, um, it's harder to see differences in abundance or richness. Um, but if you look here, you can also see that this is true, right? There's not a lot of differences in the taxa richness between, at least significantly, between um, places that had gobies and didn't have them, um, as well as uh, some of the other metrics such as diversity. Um, and then this is the percent chronomids where these were also, um, um, where they were, they were uh, measured before, with and without. One of the things that they did find though, uh, and this is where those darters come into play, was that the darters were completely absent in streams that had gobies. And so that is a big concern because I, I come from a, a place where I, I study stream fish much more than I study lake fish. And darters are an important part of the community, um, both from a perspective of um, uh, indicating health, but also um, the, the, the role that they play by feeding on invertebrates and keeping the system in balance. So the conclusions of this paper in particular um, found that round gobies made a significant impact on benthic macroinvertebrates by predation. In particular, mayflies and caddisflies um, were missing or low in abundance. Um, and while they didn't make a direct impact on stream fish communities, they likely are competing for prey types um, that those native fish would be uh, looking for. 
And this obviously um, is, like I said, it would be a challenge for, for spawning fish as well as um, particularly the, the trout that we might be worried about, whether brown or rainbow or other things that are moving up into the, the inlets for um, spawning and foraging. So this one of this study was one of the ones that really led me to think, well, is there, what do they eat if they were given some options as well? Um, but also how does the, the benthic invertebrate community change in these lakes? And so I asked uh, these questions um, with my um, research student, Nolan. He was really interested in, um, in the, the chance that they might eat snails because we had kind of anecdotally heard that they might eat snails that because there were snails missing from Lake Ontario that we that other researchers thought would be um, really abundant. And so we went into this series of studies. And the first thing we had to do was go and get the gobies to bring them back into our laboratory. And so we got these really cool net that pull you run a seine net along, this is Cayuga Lake at the state park. You walk out into the lake you walk up parallel to the uh, lake shore and man, there were just gobies everywhere. And so it was a great way to um, source my experiments. Now, the first thing we did was we opened up their stomachs. Um, and so we wanted to see, well, what are they eating in Cayuga Lake? And so the first thing you can see is that most of this, um, this percentage uh, column graph has um, is this greenish brown and that's all mussels. So there are a lot of mussels being eaten uh, by round gobies, which is a good thing, I guess. Um, and, but there are some other things. And so there is evidence of um, amphipods, which are uh, these little side swimmers or scuds. They look like little shrimp, um, but they, they swirl around. If you were to ever catch one and put them in a dish, they so swim on their side in circles. Hemimysis is the bloody red shrimp, and then snails was detected. Snails were detected in a couple of these fish as well. And then there's lots of unknown. When you open a, a fish stomach, it's sometimes it's hard to tell. So we started doing some snail studies. So we looked at, all right, what if we put certain snails into a tank with fish, then will they eat them and how many? And it turns out that these Physidae snails um, which are things that are very common in our lakes, as well as streams, they are really um, highly preferred over some of these other ones. And Nolan did these studies uh, day and night and um, found out that uh, they eat them regardless, day or night. Um, fish do, many if you're an angler, you know that the, the low light times are good times to go fishing, um, but these fish will eat just about any time of the day. <laughs> Well, we also wanted to know if they eat the bloody red shrimp, which is an invasive um, uh, crustacean, as you can see here. And um, it was uh, the question of this came up, up with my colleague, Megan Brown and Brent Boscarino. And so we were kind of tag teaming here trying to figure out, OK, well, if we put a whole bunch of these things into a tank, will they eat them? Sure enough, they do. And interestingly, the smaller fish tended to eat more of them um, based on the number that we put into the tank. And I believe we put in, I think about 50 or 60 of these into the tank. Now these studies we did at night because the um, hemimysis is something that hides in the substrate down in, in the um, rocks during the day. And then at nighttime, during that low light time they emerge. So we did all of these studies after, after dusk, which um, made for an interesting um, work schedule. But, um, but this interestingly enough led to, well, okay, what about some other possibilities here? So we continued our studies and we said, all right, well, what about benthic prey? We're gonna put zebra mussels in with snails. We know they like snails. What would they choose snails or mussels, which one? And so we did more tank studies. And um, as you can see, we you'll see lots of pictures here. We took advantage of every single um, open space, open covered space uh, we could find on our campus. This We have a number of small houses that have lovely porches. So um, we did these studies out on um, in open air and tanks that had filtered lake water. So we lugged a lot of water and little tiny containers of pre-counted prey. Uh, that kept my students very busy. 
uh, but it was a it was a great fun. But you can see here that the snails were actually consumed more than these other options. And so you start to think, all right, well, if they have a preference, I wonder what else they would prefer in other combinations. So we also gave them the choice of pelagic prey. So things that um, are moving around in the water column. So we put hemimysis as well as these amphipods. And the amphipods are, well, hemimysis are these pinker ones, if you can see. And the scuds or, or side swimmers are the more yellow C-shaped uh, invertebrates here. And you can see that um, it looks like they eat them about the same. However, we put a whole lot of hemimysis in there and they proportionally ate amphipods uh, a higher, um, in a higher uh, number than hemimysis, than the bloody red shrimp. So this is what I call the buffet. So if you know that they have some preferences, what happens if you put all of these together? What do you choose from the buffet? And interestingly, based on numbers here, hemimysis was very popular. Um, and again, remember, this is the only thing here, sorry, not the only, but dracenids and hemimysis are invasive prey, but they are prey that the Round goby should at least evolutionarily know that they eat, whether or not they've eaten them in Keigu Lake before coming to my tanks. And then the amphipods were also eaten. Um, and so this is interesting. So still the snails, in this case, we gave them a different type of snail, uh, but these other two snails were very rarely eaten uh, and then and the others in different proportions. Now, if we look at how many different prey items we gave them based on the number, though, we can see that they preferred amphipods by far and these little side swimmers. And so that started to make me really concerned about some of the native invertebrates because these are the types of things that other native fish will definitely eat. Uh, and they do, they are very important um, functionally, they break down a lot of organic matter in um, the lake. So all those leaves and uh, the, the macro, macrophytes that die away during the year, they are, they're the ones, one of the ones responsible for breaking down all of that detritus in the bottom of the lake. All right, so in conclusion, while dracenid mussels were commonly found in some contents and in the literature found um, to be a primary prey type, we found that Brown gobies, when given a preference, ate snails, bloody red shrimp, and amphipods more commonly than others. And the consumption differed between the prey that we classified as benthic versus pelagic um, from kind of where they are in the tank, whether they're swimming around in the, in, in the water or they're sitting in front of them. And this picture actually is from one of our tank studies. So you can see the snails just kind of laying around them. Um, and then the other thing is that um, we didn't have any discernible relationships between size or sex with the prey choices, but I'm sure that there are changes over size um, if we were to continue to do this. Um, we did have, we did keep track of our, the size of our, our um, prey. And so from a, from a mouth and prey size perspective, fish can't, they don't, bite off something and then chew it for a while, like many other um, vertebrates, ter uh, terrestrial vertebrates, they are gape limited. So if it fits in their mouth, they'll eat it. They might spit it out, but they have to actually be able to get it into their mouth in order to consume it. But what was really interesting and probably one of the really fun highlights of this research was that we did find that these gobies will suck the snail right out of the shell because we found empty shells that were not empty when we started. Uh, and so that was really kind of cool and an interesting um, kind of documentation of potentially a new behavior in foraging, at least for these types of um, fish. They prefer this Bithnidae snail. Um, and we, we probably think it's because of the number that we could find in the lake and number we put into the tanks um, they could pull off the operculum, which is that kind of finger -like, fingernail-like protector that some snails have. Uh, but ultimately, the shell thickness was important. And so when you think about the types of snails or invertebrates that are most vulnerable to this type of predation, the easier it is to, to gobble down um, and crush from perspective of a hard shell, 
the easier it is to, um, to consume and they'll go after more of those in the long run. So the implications of this really are that, um, that you know, the diet is going to be determined by what's available in the lake. And so that something that's abundant is going to be consumed at higher rates. However, we do from a biological perspective, we do also think about, well, what are the energetic costs, right? And so if there's, um, if there's a candy bar sitting on the countertop versus a candy bar sitting in the back of your closet, it's gonna be whatever is easier to eat, right? You're gonna go for it. Um, but whether or not you have to actually digest a, or attempt to, to crush a shell, like in these muscles, you're gonna go for something that is, um, a lot easier to, to, um, to digest potentially based on how much energy it takes to capture it. So if you have to follow it around in circles for, for an hour, that's not gonna be worth it. But um, these are some of the things that this, this research really started to make me think about. Um, in addition though, we found that both native and non-native invertebrates uh, were, going to, were, gonna, were consumed and will be impacted by round goby predation. So ultimately, um, the movement and the colonization establishment of these gobies in Seneca Lake and other Finger Lakes um, are going to change the invertebrate food webs. And we're not really quite sure ultimately how, what that's going to do. Um, but, you know, there are some ways to think about this. And one is, well, if, um, if round gobies are breaking, are, are kind of controlling the zebra mussel population a little bit more than they were in the past, uh, than the, the populations were in the past, but they're also eating invertebrates. That's going to take some, um, some prey away from our smaller fish that are eating invertebrates and insects like yellow perch. Um, but it also, uh, could, they could potentially change how um, how successful lake trout are based on the, the fact that we know they eat uh, lake, uh, sorry, fish eggs. And so that's kind of um, challenging as well. So, you know, that our lake trout are also already um, really suffering from a couple of different issues. I and mean, that's a whole nother talk, but um, this might be playing into um, their success in the future in lakes that are um, that are uh, coincident with round goby colonization. And if you've heard anything about the round gobies, you might've said, oh, well, they're also um, being eaten by some of these large fish and they are. And I'll get to that just in, in a moment, but that's why this bass here is pictured um, a little bit larger than on the pre-invasion side. So one of the things that we did a couple of years ago um, you know, way back when in a pre-COVID land, we were out, um, we were asking people about gobies. What do you know? Um, have you caught them before? I had a student that went to bass tournaments to figure out what people thought about um, round gobies. Had they heard about them? Have they caught them? Where did they catch them? Because we were curious, well, maybe this is a source of information that we might actually be able to, um, to better understand uh, their their presence and their movement and some of the maybe their behaviors and so um, we did we had a survey that went out to landowners around Seneca Lake as I said um, asked uh, anglers who were coming off the water or going putting their boats into the water um, as well as just kind of monitoring the lake shore to figure this out and then in, in the long run we made a, a lovely fact sheet and I have this new email address. It's actually not new, but a couple years old. Um, and so if anybody ever finds a round goby, you can email me at roundgoby at hws.edu. Um, and this is particularly for Seneca as we were concerned about, um, you know, folks along the, the lake shore or, or fishing. What, how would you actually contact anybody uh, to get that information out? You can obviously tell the DEC as well. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but you can also email roundgoby at hws.edu and it'll come into my inbox. Um, so uh, we are con concerned about that. Um, we are curious about this as um, anglers are probably going to have the most contact um, with them as they start to spread through Seneca Lake. Um, as a, I, I, I'm sure that they will spread throughout most lakes in the area. Um, but I think Canandaigua Lake has probably quite a while until it gets there. 
uh, thank goodness, um, because of the connections to um, to the Erie Canal as well as um, as some well some of the other waterways that are are have Rangobi populations already. Um, so that's good. But what we do find, um, and this is something that we kind of we're starting to hear from um, on the the Great Lakes side of things, is that wow, you know what? Those sculpins, slimy sculpins in Lake Ontario were disappearing. And guess what? The round goby was actually taking the place in the stomachs of many of these fish. So you have large and small off bass, you have um, the walleye, the yellow perch, this great uh, lake sturgeon. They're even finding these that lake sturgeon are eating round gobies, which I guess is a good thing, right? Um, pike, uh, trout. And, and what's really fun too, of course, is one of my students, the student that did the, the bass um, tournament surveys got this direct quote, they make my bass big. And anglers are really happy about this. And so I guess, you know, there's your pro, um, there's your benefit. They make their fish big. But as you can see, the, the girth on this fish is a lot larger than you might expect. And this is why um, the fish, I think a couple of years ago, was a large bass on the front of the New York uh, Fishing Regs uh, magazine was a fish that probably is packed with gobies from somewhere. So, so you got your cons and you got your pros. I should have probably labeled it the cons and the pros of an invader, but, um, but that's that. So um, I thank you so much for spending your lovely warm evening on Zoom with me tonight. Um, and I'm available for any questions if you have them. Great, thank you, Susan. That was very interesting and um, great to learn about all the research that's even being done locally here in the Finger Lakes about this new invader. Um, feel free to use the chat to type in some questions that you may have. We've got about 10, 15 minutes to take Q and A. Um, I did have a, a couple of folks write in in advance. They had some burning questions they wanted answered. Uh, some of which I'm reviewing the list now, some of which you've already addressed, but there are a couple others that maybe we can uh, throw out there to get the ball rolling for Q&A. Uh, potential long-term impact on zebra and quagga mussel populations. Do you anticipate that? Um, I would say that um, obviously they're, they're a, a known predator of the quagga and zebra mussels. So that's, that's good. Um, that would definitely um, help regulate the populations a bit. Um, I've been asked this before by some other um, state workers and I don't really know if we have um, any, I think if the best model would be from the, um, the Great Lakes and right now I'm not really sure that that is something that is um, going to change them significantly, but I guess we can hope. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll leave that at that. Um, Bill from Seneca Lake wrote in, I'd like to know if they have been, intro been introduced purposely for Dresden control anywhere. For what type of control? For muscle control anywhere. Have they been introduced purposely? I haven't heard that at all. Um, I do know that um, of that, that angler survey um, that that there was, you know, like jokes of like, oh, well, I might move them around um, to make my bass big in, you know, Canandaigua Lake or something like that. And that was kind of scary. Um, but, you know, those types of bait transfers, um, that type of stuff has happened before. Um, I don't know of any place that I've not heard of anybody or, or any place that that has been moved purposely. And um, so it's possible, though. Let's hope, our, let's hope it doesn't happen. They can get around quick enough without, uh, but the more isolated inland lakes, I would say that that, if it does show up in, you know, like Honeyway Lake or something like that, that's probably why. <laughs> that kind of addresses the next question that came in. What makes you think gobies will wind up in lakes that have impassable barriers? Apart from accidental or intentional introductions, how would they wind up in Keuka Lake or Skinny Atlas Lake, for example? Yeah. 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 Well, um, Cuca Lake, um, obviously there's, I think I haven't followed, uh, the outlet the whole way, but there would be, there's obviously some pretty good barriers, um, 
dam barriers and things like that. They have gotten through the lock system in, um, in the Seneca Cayuga Canal. And so in that respect, um, that has not been a challenge to them so far. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I would hope that they, it's going to be a long time to get to some of those more interior lakes um, that have longer uh, inlets to them. For example, Owasco uh, from uh, that long, um, or I guess outlet at Owasco Lake, um, you know, that the concern would be whether or not the food source is moving. And that's actually some of the um, the conclusions of the a more recent paper that Megan Brown and Brent, Brent Boscarino and I published that was essentially, you know, if the food is is moving, may, these invasive species are moving, then there's a chance that the brown goby might follow them, if you will, spatially. Um, but barriers, yeah, obviously that's going to create a, a harder chance to get to those inland places. Great. Um, and I know you just shared uh, your email address for reporting, but uh, a, a question from Lynn asks, is Gobi reporting, reporting available on IMAP invasives? Would you encourage folks to also report there? Yeah, definitely. I believe it, Round Gobi is on there. I haven't been on there in a while, um, but I would I guess that it is and that you can report it that way too. Mm -hmm. And she also asks if we can get a copy of the brochure that you have so that we can actually share with our members in our, in our public. Yeah, meeting. sure. Yep, I can email that to you and then you can post that. That was something that I'd given out to, I think the um, Slipwa organization, but definitely, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Finger Lakes document. So Finger Lakes Institute document. Um, uh, going back to another couple of questions that were written in, in advance. Um, which you may or may not have the answer to, but we'll throw them out there. Potential long long term impacts on mud puppy populations. Yeah, you know, I I actually just learned about mud puppies probably um, just before COVID hit, um, probably 19, 2019, um, and that they are in Cayuga Lake. Um, I I have I do not know much about the mud puppy population and. I, you know, when you look it up, I don't even know if they're technically native to the area. Um, so we're talking about a salamander who, for those of you who are not familiar with them, but apparently they are, um, they're voracious carnivores that I think go after bait on hooks. And so fishermen sometimes get them. Um, I have no idea. I have no idea. I really don't know enough about the mud puppy to know if their habitat would overlap um, or if you know, any of those interactions would Im impact them. Okay, uh, John writes, um, on Cayuga Lake, the gobies have wiped out most of the inshore invasive mussels that were very abundant just 10 years ago. We have also had some goby die-offs. How do you think this will play out? So he was talking about um, Cayuga Lake. Yes, Cayuga Lake. Yeah. So one of the things I didn't include um, in this talk was um, just again in, in it was 2019, um, you know, back when I actually was doing research <laughs> um, out on the water, um, we did a study of invertebrates of Cayuga Lake and um, Seneca Lake. So it took invertebrates off the bottom of the water, a bottom of the lake in a number of places and compared it to a study in Seneca Lake and Cayuga Lake pre a goby invasion. I think the publication date was like 2011 or something like that. And we did see different differences in invertebrates in the bottom of the lake. So this is where, you know, the, um, it was kind of a preliminary pilot study, so I didn't show it here, but I do think that um, the invertebrates are going to change, the community is going to change in these lakes. Um, I don't know exactly, uh, you know, what this will mean for, um, specifically for certain fish species, but um, it will, there will be changes occurring for sure. I don't know if I answered the question, if there was anything more to that question. No, I, I think that that's, that seems good. Okay. Um, great. Okay. Um, well, let's see. It's, it's 8, 8.01 right now. So, um, you know, Susan, th thank you so much for your time. I think we, we will wrap it up if there's not any uh, last minute questions coming in, but 
if folks do have follow-up questions, are, are they welcome to use your HWS email address? Definitely, yep. Mm -hmm. you? For sure. And I do recognize a number of names out there. Thanks to everybody I know. <laughs> I think you all know who you are. Thanks for joining in today. Yeah, Katie Hawkins writes in, thanks for sharing this information. It was really informative and, and I tend to agree. So we really appreciate you taking the time. This is awesome to learn about and we look forward to, to working with you to help spread the message about keeping an eye out for this new invader. Yeah, I, I hope it doesn't appear in Canada like ever um, and we'll keep our fingers crossed. So, um, but obviously the key with invasive species is education and learning how to identify that so that we can at least know what we're dealing with, so. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for your time tonight. And thank you all for attending. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks, Susan. No problem. All right. Well, thanks.